So I have uh, some uh, questions to you. Uh, you have uh, visited different countries with different political situation. Is there a place for dangerous moment to your life in your activity? Uh, for instance, uh, Somalia or or in other dangerous countries? Um, I would say that, so I haven't been to Somalia, but um, um, but we do have a project there. And if I do go, it would be done on under very secure circumstances. So we pick, pick a location that is, that is, um, that has been like, and it's not just about me. I would never want to bring a victim or something, someone into an area where they're, where they're at risk. I did, however, work in a very sensitive kind of issue when I was in Cambodia, which was land rights. So often mm -hmm. you're involved in, when you're involved in business and human rights, often you're involved against companies who have kind of vested interests. Uh, and sometimes the, uh, what, who is a member of the company and who, who is a member of a government, it's not always, it's always clear if there's a distinction. So I've definitely kind of experienced, um, like I didn't personally feel a threat, but I felt like my colleagues, specifically who are advocating for this that they were cont continuously intimidated uh, and the organization that i worked for there was actually shut down by the government um under the pretext of um of not complying with a with a an ngo law um i have definitely worked with human rights defenders in contexts where it's not safe in Myanmar specifically, I work with people who are, who I feel like their lives are at risk every day. Um, and people who report from refugee camps in, uh, I've had uh, a colleague of mine was murdered last year in, uh, in for, for his uh, advocacy. Um, so I definitely haven't quite experienced like being in that kind of situation but i and, and and honestly like we we kind of like pr privilege we we're not the ones who are um you know in in the grips of of, of of the work so we kind of don't experience the same threats when i was in cambodia it was really like being foreign like afforded you a certain degree of protection um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, but um, yeah. So that's that's um, yeah. My my answer. I did. I worked a, a lot on North Korea as well, but um, usually work a lot of the case times I dealt with um, repatriates, so people who had been who'd basically made the journey from North Korea and had had made it to South Korea. So I never actually was on the ground, and then uh, I worked at the Khmer Rouge tribunal. Like, you know, when I, by the time that I was working on these cases, it was 30 years since the crimes had happened. So, you know, there's a kind of, you know, when you work on these kind of big historical cases, the more time that elapses, generally the safer it is. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, you named uh, security circumstances. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, is it uh, mean that you use uh, armed uh, guard or some uh, bodyguard uh, or, or something else? Um, so, no, usually, I mean, uh, no, you would definitely not. It, 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 and it would never be kind of security protocol, but like a ri we have what are called risk mitigation mm -hmm. uh, documents. So it could be like the provision of a safe house um, or we might you know, have to relocate someone to a different country for a different period of time. We might have to, you know, use a different border. Like mm -hmm. it's basically involves kind of monitoring the situation and then knowing when to react. It would never involve having access to like a weapon or anything, especially if you're working for a civil society. If you're working in a war zone, you'll probably have the protection of, a, of an army or the of um, mm -hmm. blue helmets. Um, but like when you're working for kind of a grassroots NGO with human rights defenders and, you know, often the people you're speaking out against to is the powerful government. So it's very little you can do in terms of like protecting yourselves other than knowing 
when it's the right time to leave, knowing when it's the right time to, you know, watch what it is that you're saying. Um, so that's really, it's more risk mitigation than security. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you choose next country, your next client for the working mission? Uh, which are criteria are the main for your organization? So we don't really choose and more, and more that people come after us. So like, I guess, uh, like a common theme to all of our countries is that they're all common law jurisdictions. So we have the same legal system. They're also, we're a former British colony. They're, it's not like we only exclusively work with former British, like common law countries. It just happens that they have the same legal system. And that means that like our expertise is, is welcome. <laughs> There. So the reason we were, we were approached in Zambia because of our work in Malawi, and now in in both Zambia and Malawi, there because corruption is such a huge issue in both of these countries, um, our the diplomatic presence of Ireland there, they're they're asked to assist in these things, and then their first uh, point of call is us because we're we're not just an NGO. We're like we have access to like lawyers from the law society and the bar across both jurisdictions so we can kind of find expertise really really quickly and uh, so sometimes if we're not the lawyers we're we're, we're like we're going seeking out a judge who's adjudicated over financial crimes and then we're asking them to develop a, a training curriculum and then we're facilitating kind of an exchange um with Zambia but then there's like often we like to be able to react to stuff that's topical as well so we have the projects, but we also, I guess, like to with Afghanistan or with Ukraine, we don't like to wait uh, until. Uh, so, like, whenever there's a, like a, a a blatant attack on the international rule of law, we we tend to 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 react to that as well. Um, but yeah, usually usually they choose us. Uh, we don't choose them. Uh, okay. Uh, for example, if we talk about Malawi, uh, is it mean that uh, Malawi authorities uh, invite you to cooperate or another human rights uh, organization uh, in, in this era invite you to, to cooperate in, in, in some country? No, it'd be usually the, the way it has typically worked would be Malawi might ask the Irish embassy or Ireland mm. if they have expertise. In, in a certain area. And then the Irish embassy in that country will reach out to us. Be like, can you provide us with rule of law expertise in these specific areas? And because we have such access to such a such a network of, of lawyers, it's really easy for us to find like, and you know, it's not always the interesting human rights, financial crimes aspects. You know, we were asked to contribute to the development of probate law like which is like wills in in Malawi which actually does kind of have a human rights component because of the way um succession happens in Malawi tends to disfavor the um basically land is doesn't go to where where it should be especially when it's a uh, uh, widows so um yeah sometimes sometimes we kind of intervene over niche areas of law like probate um, but usually the requests come from from the embassy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, does your organization help to establish, uh, to incorporate a similar organization in other countries? For example, maybe uh, maybe in Ukraine, like a potential cooperation in the future? Well, we don't currently. Um, but like, I guess the idea would be that the the Ukraine Bar Association could have some sort of charitable arm and do similar work, um, like Irish rule of law. Yeah, I don't, I don't see what, I don't see see why why that wouldn't be a, po a possibility. And we we definitely be willing to help or assist in in whatever that would look like. I know that we've kind of sp spoken to. We're very new, relatively. We've only existed since two thousand and seven. Malawi is 10 years old, you know, it's a very new organization. I've spoken to countries 
and organ like our equivalent in the Netherlands, and they've been doing what we've been doing for 40 years. So, and they've they kind of reached out to us to share. And I think, the, I guess the 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 areas of it would be identifying kind of you know, and you see that the way we it wasn't really planned. We started out doing these really small kind of trainings, and then you just kind of fall into something where you all of a sudden you develop this expertise and people are coming to you. So like Malawi started out with a couple of lawyers going for three months a year. And then we it, it turned out to be quite important work. So we only started hiring permanent staff. So it developed. Um, and I think that, you know, it would be in a future time, like Ukraine would have a lot to offer in terms of like maybe over the work that's being done in prosecuting war crimes, uh, like at a domestic level, the mm -hmm. kind of extent to which that's being done in Ukraine is not really, uh, you don't see that being done. Mostly it's done by international kind of accountability mechanisms. Um, so I, I absolutely think seeing that like Ukraine would have amazing expertise um, to, to, to kind of facilitate other countries and in, in in kind of capacity building over some 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 distinct issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean uh, that uh, if we'd like uh, like a Ukrainian bar association, for example, to uh, share of our expertise with uh, uh, with another country, uh, with other countries, uh, for example, countries in uh, in Africa. Uh, about uh, human rights, about rule of law. Is it possible to cooperate to cooperate with you uh, in the field of um, incorporation of uh, establishment uh, of this international uh, rule of law organization? For example, make some trainings for our experts how we may work with uh, with other countries in this uh, in this era in this field. <laughs> So, I mean, I think, I think, it, like on, on kind of maybe general human rights work. Yes, the, I think my the biggest obstacle I would see is I think the like the reason why we're able to work so is because the legal systems are so similar to Ireland in, in the in the countries. Like we don't work in any civil jurisdiction in 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 Africa. So, like if we were kind of tailoring a training we kind of have to be very specific about what it is. So like if it was engaging with kind of international, international law, then I don't see like how there would be any issue. But if it was kind of more like domestic trainings, uh, uh, I'm not sure if, if, the, if, the, if the different legal systems would present a barrier. But there are always things, like I always said that, you know, it's not always the law and it's not always about lawyering it, but like sometimes it's about like how you overcame uh, mm -hmm. a systematic, a, an issue that was systemic to like, it's not often the law or the lawyers, it's the filing system that that's an issue. So there's always kind of like areas where um, you could learn from like people who've dealt with big, lots of cases or who've had overcrowded prisons, you know, I think I think we need to discuss kind of um, like maybe the certain areas that you've worked in uh, and developed expertise and then we could see if we could like I would be totally open to like receiving advice as I rely now if you, uh, on like prison decongesting or uh, bail or um, I don't know doing advocacy against the death penalty or or uh, forced confessions and torture. You know, it's, um, I guess it would be kind of just identifying those areas uh, where mm -hmm. we, we, we could learn. But like, yeah, for, for, for the most part, I think that we are a little bit restrained uh, in those projects uh, based on the fact that we have the same legal system and also their legal system is carried out in English, which helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ukraine have mean uh, have many um, experts in uh, human rights uh, field and uh, in uh, rule of law. Uh, is it possible for for Ukrainian expert uh, uh, join to your organization, maybe uh, in remotely and and maybe work remotely? Yeah. 
uh, to to like work uh, in, is like tech, technical expertise or as employees like to 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 in the same way that we facilitate that we in the same way we'll we'll facilitate the exchange of Irish expertise with Malawi or Zambia. We would do the same with with Ukraine. Is that the question? Uh, yes, yes, but uh, and uh, I mean that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, is it possible for for Ukrainian experts uh, in uh, uh, rule of law or in uh, human rights uh, to cooperate with uh, your organization and join to some of your mission in uh, uh, in different countries? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we just need to, I mean, this could be the topic of a separate meeting, I guess, but it would be, mm -hmm. I kind yeah. of just would need to, to see what areas where, where we could use the expertise and then kind of facilitate something. Okay, and for this reason, my next question, could you name main requirements for joining uh, an international organization? So the main requirements for getting a job in international law or working for a, an international. So I, I think that like one of the, how I started out is I did an internship and then mm -hmm. I ended up, I, I was lucky enough to get a job straight after. Um, and then I ended up working in Cambodia for six years and I came back to Ireland. So that's the, the, the toughest thing about international work is getting your foot in the door. So it's your first kind of uh, area or your first position. And, but like once you get the first job and you've worked it for like two years, then, then it's a lot easier to, to stay in the field. So, um, I mean, one thing is like, you're all already fully qualified lawyers. That's given you you know the base kind of qualification to get into it and then you know like it's it is it is difficult because it's often you have mm -hmm. to work for very little money or unpaid um like my first six months were unpaid and then i was paid very little money so you kind of have to go at it and which is completely unfair um but I, like a, a really good way of getting into the field is and to be paid well is the you know the united nations volunteers unv they call it un volunteers but they're not actually volunteers and especially if you've already got kind of extensive experience as a lawyer um you'll you'll be able to kind of work on kind of rule of law issues in 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 many different kind of jurisdictions and then they often will pay off with kind of um pay job uh, and another thing i kind of wanted to highlight is the like like often when you work in international human rights organizations it's not just law that you need to be uh skilled in but you need to kind of have project management kind of development mm -hmm. skills which is like this kind of different framework so we also kind of finding out um, where you could kind of get that expertise. But I would say that the best way would be to, to try, and uh, it might even be volunteering at the beginning. Um, and then once you've got your foot into the work, it becomes a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, do you record human rights relations or lack in the rule of law and send it like a report to, to the United Nations? yeah yes so uh we have so so like we work we engage with the united nations a lot of different procedures so last year in southeast asia we worked with the united nations working group on arbitrary detention so this is like a it's a special procedure and you file kind of cases on behalf of individuals and then the working group will decide whether or not the the detention was done on arbitrary grounds. We've also we've also filed uh, reports before the United Nations Committee Against Torture, the Human Rights Committee, which is the treaty body for the uh, International uh, um, <clears throat> Convention on Civil and Political Rights. We have um, 
we have filed submissions before the uh, UPR, which is the uh, Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council, which covers all uh, of the human rights treaties that that country is a signatory to. So yes, we do. Uh, we have involved, we have been engaged with these kind of UN processes before um, quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, how do you understand that uh, your mission is complete in uh, in some countries? So, if our mission, we should we should really it is, it's a very complicated question, right? Because it's um, often often the problems you're trying to address are systemic, and they it's very hard to resolve it as one organization but you need kind of a sector-wide response or uh, like a complete shift in um in in go like government priorities as well so the, the measure of success we should we should be redundant right we like when we're successful that means we're no longer needed at all we should be all working towards not having a job in reality, uh, in reality, there's like so many different kind of political issues. You know, something like inflation, like that's happening, that can that can cause like, and there can be increased crime rates as a result of that. Um, like you know, COVID. There's like these kind of things that are like outside of your control, or like corruption. You know, like there's only. You know, we're never going to completely solve all of the issues in in any of our countries. So, like, it's really you need to really take a you need to be really patient, and you need to have a very uh, long view of what you term as a success or impact. So, like, that's what I was saying. Sustainability is really important to our work. If we just release people from prison, you know because we're there and we're doing that job, it means that if we leave tomorrow, then that's not gonna continue. So like, we really need to ensure that the skills and expertise that we're bringing is completely embedded within the partner organization and localized. So everything we do should eventually be handed over to a local partner who is capable of running that without any assistance at all from us. Now, the complicated issue is because of the resource, like there's such poor countries that like it's often, it's a question of not having enough resources to, to continue these things. And then when donors pull out or when, you know, you know, when costs rise, you know, this all has a kind of an effect. So, you know, how are we, you need to take a very, um, you need to be very patient in this field and you need to have a very, you need to look very far ahead. Um, and also you need to also know that it's not just you, you can't change anything if the institutions are not willing to change. And you need to assess at some point is like, is it what you're doing effective or working? Um, and if you're just creating a reliance on, on something, then you might may, may, maybe have an honest conversation with yourself as to whether or not you're doing more harm than good by being there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, James, uh, for your time. Thank you for this uh, presentation. I wish you good luck and uh, big success in your activity. Thank and you. And hope for, for our future uh, co cooperation uh, between our organization. Absolutely. And I like reach out to me if you if you want to discuss kind of areas. I am completely open to the idea of collaboration. It's just I think we need to kind of have a talk, uh, not in this kind of where I'm presenting, but we can kind of roll ideas off each other. And I'd just like to thank everyone for coming and, and listening today. Uh, I hope it, it's very hard to kind of cover everything that we do in, in a very succinct way, but I hope I gave you an idea as to the type of work. Obviously, it's very focused on criminal justice. You know, there are human rights organizations that do different things. But anyway, um, Thank you for having me. And uh, it was really, really a pleasure. Any support I can give to Ukraine or the UBA, um, just please reach out to me um, and thank you. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, James. Take care and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.